Hi, and welcome to this brief presentation about representative and robust monitoring guidelines for NRMs, and specifically in this presentation about achieving robustness with our monitoring. My name is Jules Fennell, and I'm the Marion Planning Coordinator at NQ Dry Tropics. This presentation will complement the guidelines that are available on the NRM Regions Queensland website in the SWIFT resources section. I recommend having the guidelines with you uh, for this presentation and we'll be concentrating on what's covered in pages 19 to 34. This presentation is a short presentation that will focus on achieving robustness with our monitoring. I'd just like to quickly note at this point that this presentation and the guidelines are about biophysical monitoring, that is changes in the physical environment. While the principles of representativeness and robustness are also important in social monitoring, we're not going to be covering them here. So why does achieving robust monitoring matter? There's four main reasons. When we apply for and get an NRM project, we're stating to the funder that we're going to deliver a particular outcome. Monitoring is the way that we are able to demonstrate that we achieved that outcome. Also, NRM organisations are science-based organisations in that science informs what we do, such as the interventions that we apply to create change in the landscape. While our monitoring doesn't need to reach the standard necessary for research, it still needs to be based on scientific principles. When we create a change in the landscape, we want to understand what happened and to learn from this what has worked and what is an effective intervention, but we also need to know what didn't work. Monitoring gives us the data to be able to understand what happened. The majority of our projects are funded through government programs and that is they are funded by the taxpayer. So we need to be able to show what benefit was achieved for the investment and monitoring enables us to do this with credibility. A way to sum this up is that we want our monitoring data to be sufficiently credible that we're confident in its reliability and that it would stand up to scrutiny by others. So in this presentation, we'll be focusing on one half of the equation, and that is robustness. The other half of the equation is representativeness. So what do we mean by robustness? Basically, it's how well you did your monitoring to ensure that your data is reliable, consistent, and accurate. Ensuring robustness means that we can have confidence that our monitoring data is an adequate representation of the condition of an asset or landscape and the change in that asset or landscape. Key thing to understand is that when we monitor, we are usually only sampling a very small area and using this data to extrapolate or infer what happened at our monitoring plots to what happened across the whole area. So for example, if we're doing veg cats to monitor the condition of a 150 hectare area of native vegetation, we would use six monitoring plots. Each monitoring plot is 500 square meters or 0.05 of a hectare. Therefore, six veg cats plots would equal 0.3 hectares. So this means that out of an 150 hectare site, we're monitoring less than half a hectare, and we're using that data to say what is going on across that whole 150 hectare area. Therefore, getting it right matters. It's also worth noting here that monitoring requires a considerable amount of time and effort, and we wanna make sure that that time and effort isn't wasted by collecting data that can't be relied upon, or in the worst case scenario, can't even be used. So firstly, having a look at sufficient replication. This is a critical part of achieving robust monitoring as the number of monitoring sites or the amount of monitoring data you collect has a direct relationship with how robust your data is. Basically, the fewer sites you have, the less confidence you can have in your data. So now we're going to look at an example for this and there's quite a lot going on in this slide, but we're going to talk our way through it. So you can see the three diagrams at the top and they represent a mapped area that's been overlaid with a grid. Now, each cell in the grid is one hectare, and you can see the project polygon outlined in black, and the total area for that is 233 hectares. Now, for the sake of this example, we're gonna pretend that we know what the condition of every hectare is within that project polygon, so we can compare what's actually there with what the monitoring would tell us is there. Now, if we look at the first diagram, you can see where the X's are. That's three monitoring plots that have been randomly distributed within the polygon. Based on those three plots, we would extrapolate that there's only very poor and poor condition areas at the site, which is obviously not the case. Now, if you have a look at the second diagram, you can see an additional three crosses. So we've now got six monitoring plots 
and based on those we'd extrapolate that there are areas in very poor and poor condition with a small area in excellent condition. So it's getting a little bit closer to what's actually there but still not accurate. Now if you have a look at the third diagram we've added three more monitoring plots and that brings us up to nine. So keep in mind that the nine plots still only represent 3.9% of the total project area so we're still sampling a very small proportion of what's there. However, what you can see is that with now with the nine plots that we now have all four condition types represented. Now the numbers that go with this, if you have a look at the table that's at the bottom of the diagram, you can see the numbers. So if you look at the numbers for three monitoring plots, you can see that it said zero for excellent condition and zero for good condition, obviously, which isn't the case. It also gave a score of 67% for poor condition land, which is fair way from the 36% that we know is there. Whereas if you look at the nine monitoring plots down the bottom, you can see the excellent condition and the good condition are both represented. And those proportions are relatively close to what's actually there. And likewise for the poor condition and very poor, very poor condition, that those numbers are also quite close to what the actual numbers are. So we can see from this that the number of monitoring plots really matters. If we have too few, we really don't have much confidence in what they're telling us about the whole site. The next thing to consider in achieving robustness is following the monitoring methodology you're using as it is written and intended. So most monitoring methodologies have been written in a specific way with specific instructions on how each attribute is measured and recorded. If you don't follow this, it means that we can no longer have confidence in the results being generated and in extreme cases it may actually render the data unusable. So this includes things like making sure we're not taking shortcuts, so such as guesstimating a measurement or doing things like collecting data from a quarter of the site and then timesing it by four. Each time the methodology is not followed as it's intended, it's reducing the robustness of that data and therefore how confident we can be that it's right. Another aspect of achieving robustness is eliminating or reducing variability. Now variability refers to variation in the data due to external factors. So when we're doing our monitoring, we want to make sure that any data we're recording is an accurate reflection of the condition or the change, not a reflection of who was doing the monitoring or the conditions under which the monitoring was done or other external variables. So the variability that can affect our monitoring data can come from a range of sources. So as an example, if you had two people doing monitoring and they perceive things differently, one person might say that canopy cover was 60% while the other person might think it was 70%. And over multiple monitoring plots, this difference could end up having a significant effect on the data. As another example, if we set up a monitoring plot and we did a first round of monitoring and then came back a year later to do another round of monitoring, but we didn't do it on the exact same plot, we would have introduced variation in our data because there'll be differences between the first plot and the second one, even if they're close together. As a final example, if we're using specific equipment to take measurements, we need to make sure that that equipment is working properly. So if you were using it to take a whole lot of measurements and then realised it hadn't been calibrated properly, that means all of those measurements can't be used as they're not correct. So ultimately it's up to you as the person who's planning and undertaking the monitoring to identify the potential sources of variation and manage them. The last of our elements for robustness is checking your data. So we can't assume that our data has always been entered correctly or has uploaded without errors, etc. So we need to check it. Ideally, you do this during or as soon as possible after monitoring so you can correct the errors while the monitoring is still fresh in your mind. If you have a look at that table on the slide, um, have you been able to spot the incorrect value in the data set yet? Um, if you haven't, if you look under attribute 3 and plot 11, you'll see the maximum value for this attribute is 20. However, there's a value of 63 there. So when you were running the analysis on this data, the value would either skew the analysis or result in an error reading. And that's obviously not what we want. So that's why we go through and check that data to make sure all the values are right. In addition to the four considerations for robustness we've just covered, there's an additional option for helping to ensure your data is robust, and that is validation techniques. So these techniques are particularly useful if you haven't been able to monitor as planned or if you're trying something new and you're going to need additional data to support the outcome that you've achieved. In this example, the project site is a grazing area and they'll be implementing a new grazing regime. 
to be able to show the changes in the landscape are due to the new grazing regime and not other factors such as rain, they've set up a control plot in a paddock that's immediately adjacent to the project site and has all the same features such as the same land type and starting condition. In this way, the monitoring data from the control plot can be compared to that at the project site to know what changes have occurred only in the project site and therefore were due to the new grazing regime. So, Wrapping up what we've covered in this presentation, to achieve robustness of our monitoring data, we need to have enough monitoring plots or replication. We need to follow the methodology as written, be aware of and manage any sources of variability and check our data and correct it if necessary. Doing all of these things means that we can have confidence that our data is a good representation of the asset or landscape and any changes that occurred. Now, while it might seem like a lot of work, being able to credibly and reliably demonstrate the outcome of our project is a vital part of good project delivery and ensuring we get more projects in the future. Once you establish processes and procedures to support robust monitoring, it will quickly become second nature. This presentation has focused on robustness, which of course is only one half of the equation, with the other half being representativeness. Representativeness is covered in the guidelines on pages 7 to 18, and there's a similar presentation to this one available on the NRM Regions Queensland website. Thank you for watching this presentation and happy monitoring.